Hello Sector Watchers, welcome to the show. This is the 98th episode of Sector Spotlight for Tuesday the 28th of September, recording it on Monday the 27th. My name is Julius de Kempenaar and I am presenting to you from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. You can see my contact details on the screen. If you have anything to share, uh, remarks, feedback, please uh, let us know either in the comments below the video or via one of the handles that you can see right now. We love the feedback, we love to hear from you and generally respond to uh, each and every message. Maybe not right away, maybe not the same day, but in general you will get a reply. If there are any good questions, we'll deal with them in the show because we believe that that is um, probably one of the best ways to, uh, to learn because there's at least one person who uh, wants to know that particular question. It is the last Tuesday of the month and that means that we're going to look at seasonality in this show. That's a fixed item, a fixed segment that's coming back each month. Last Tuesday of the show, we're going to take a look at the seasonal patterns for next month and see if we can find any meaningful alignments with current rotations on the RRGs. So let's start right away. We're going we're gonna to kick off with a, uh, a review and a look back on rotations for asset classes. And after that, we're going to do the same for sectors and blend our seasonal views into that look back on the daily RRGs, the weekly RRGs and what's happening on the seasonality charts. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Sector Spotlight. What is the story for asset classes with their rotations last week? On the right hand side of the screen we have the daily RRG showing five trading days and on the left hand side we have the weekly RRG showing five weeks of trading. If we start with the, with the right hand side with the daily RRG, rank it on the performance then we see that both commodity ETFs DJP and GSG are topping the list with 1.8 and 2.1 percent gains. Um, they are pretty much confirming the current strength of uh, the commodity area, the commodity commodities as an asset class. It was a good week for stocks last week. ITOT went up 50 basis points and also the dollar gained again. We're going to dive into that a little bit um, deeper later on. Our benchmark up 20 basis points, almost unchanged, and we have the fixed income stuff uh, below high yield minus 10 bips, uh, corporate bonds minus 30 and government bonds minus 50 bips, half a percent. And real estate went through a, a weak week with a loss of 90 basis points, 0.9%. Um, if we look at the rotation during the week, then we see that the, the stock market and, and real estate started off uh, on a weak note and then they picked up at the end of the week. With, um, with a pickup in, uh, in relative momentum over the last two days. And we see the current strength of both commodities with DJP losing some momentum, but GSG continuing to move to the right, um, moving higher on the RS ratio scale. Government bonds, corporate bonds, high yield rolling over slightly together with the um, dollar at, at the end of the week. If we Put that in a, a little bit longer term perspective here on the left hand side. Then we see commodities uh, picking up inside weakening and they're starting to roll up. And as we know that that is, that is a good thing that seems to be, they seem to be starting the second lag of an already rising relative trend. V and Q is highest on the RS ratio scale, but uh, moving at a negative heading at the moment, but uh, given that very high reading on the RS ratio scale, that still remains a solid asset class. And you can see that the process that we noticed in ITOT, in the stock market, um, starting last two weeks, uh, moving lower on the RS ratio scale is continuing, and the opposite is uh, continuing in government bonds. 
you see that they're all very close together. So I think the me basic message from, uh, from an asset class perspective is that the, the rotations that we are monitoring are still there. Uh, the, the, the clash between stocks and bonds is, is going on. Um, bonds seem to be on the winning hand over the last, well, we, we've seen that over the last few weeks and it seems to be continuing despite the strength of the stock market last week. And uh, definitely the commodity, uh, the commodity markets are doing a really good job uh, picking up relative strength and relative momentum again. Now let's take a look at some of the individual charts and I would like to start with the chart of the US dollar. Uh, here on the right hand side you see the chart of the US dollar index with relative strength versus VBI and X so it matches the position here on the RRG. Um, a few weeks ago we discussed the breakout of the US dollar index from this base pattern potential double bottom that didn't really get any follow through. Uh, as a matter of fact, we dropped back into the pattern, uh, which wasn't that good. Luckily enough or good enough, the, the new low was made here at 91.80, which was slightly above, um, well, at the same level, 91.78 of that previous low. And we are now in a new attempt to, uh, to break away, to break above that resistance level. Now I had that, that thicker red line drawn here over the, I call that the meat of the high, so I ignore those, those sh the, where, where they shoot off and don't, don't um, close higher, so it close back into that cluster of prices. Um, that seems to be happening again now. So I think that that resistance has now evolved into more of a resistance area. And I think we should label that between 93.15, which is that thick line, and the dotted line here is 93. Let's round it off at 70 or 75. So um, what, we, what we would like to see, what we need to see to, to get more convinced for uh, more dollar strength, is a break above that dotted line. That's 93.70, 93.75. Um, we, we, I guess that we will then see a further follow through and a stronger US dollar across the board. If we put that onto the weekly chart of Euro dollar, and um, I'm not sure if you remember that we had that, that was a, um, a high low, open high low close chart just a normal chart where I drawn in that potential head and shoulders. <clears throat> and then the, the red line here, the thick red line was the neckline and we had the break here. This is the same level as that we were just looking in the dollar index. We, we got back above that neckline, which usually is not too good of a sign. But if you get that, if it, if it gets a little bit messy, then what I like to do is, is uh, clean up my chart and look at a just a basic line chart only connecting the closes. And what you see then is that that neckline is angled slightly higher and you can see that where it touches the armpits and then it broke earlier, got a little bit of a pullback again, and now it's getting lower. So it's, it's the same pattern as for the dollar index, but then the reverse. And I think we can still say that this head and shoulders pattern and the follow through is intact. What we would like to see, what we need to see here on a closing basis, this is a weekly chart, so on the Friday close, if we close below 117, uh, the lower the better, <clears throat> the stronger the signal for more weakness in the US dollar. And if we um, finally put that on the daily chart, you can see here that it's actually, if you put it on a daily, this is the level that we were watching. There's one 16.64, it's the previous low. Uh, that's the next target. And then we got six successively, successively uh, lower prices. I mean, the lower highs are still there. You see that this market is pushing lower. Um, 116, 116.60, 116.80, all these levels, the more, get broken, the weaker this gets. And if Euro dollar weakens, that means a strengthening 
of the dollar against the euro. And I think that is what we will be seeing uh, going forward. Okay, so enough for that for, uh, for euro dollar. Now, uh, another chart that's worth looking at is the one for government bonds. If you look at government bonds, then you can see that um, we had that massive decline completing that double top here, um, basically the mid-section of 2020. We broke it, we dropped, and we found a low here near 26 in the, in the GOVT ETF. <clears throat> out, of that, out of that low, we rallied. Uh, and got to admit, it went a little bit further than I thought, but it looks as if between 26, 95, 27, a new level of resistance, a new area of resistance has, uh, has been found. And we are again on the verge of completing a double top pattern. Now, if you put all that into a bigger picture, then you got a high here, which formed as a double top. We have a low, and now it looks, we're not there yet, but it looks as if we're getting a new double top. Uh, which would then be the, the new lower high. Uh, and that's important because if we, if we form that new lower high, then our next downside target will be around 26. And if we break that, we can go even lower. And you know that if GOFT goes lower, that means that interest rates are going up. That usually is not a very good sign for the stock market. So there is definitely some risk inherent in this uh, development that we are currently seeing in the um, government bond market, actually. Following uh, the development in the bond market, the next chart that I want to share with you is the one that shows you the relationship between stocks and bonds. And here it's ITOT and GOVT. And you can see the, the very nice trend. You can see the break here at the end of 2020. Um, you can see that it lost a little bit of pace here in April of this year. Uh, we're still rising, but the momentum, the rate of change has, um, has uh, decelerated. And that, that translates into a, I think, a very strong negative divergence between this ratio and the RSI. Um, this is much more pronounced than the negative divergence we've seen for uh, SPY. We're going to get back to that later on. But um, this negative divergence is still there. The rate of change of that rise is decelerating. I think that if you look at the two lows here, so that's the week of August 16 and last week, because this is the first um, day of this week, those lows are 369 and 369 is exactly the same level. If that breaks, then the ratio stocks bonds, I think, um, is reversing and can start accelerating to the downside. And that means that government bonds are getting more attractive than stocks. Um, still, some inherent risks. Uh, especially for the stock market, also for the bond market, but definitely for the stock market. Longer term, we're going to look at the monthly charts next week. Longer term, all these trends are still there, but there is so much uh, downside risk within these uptrends that I am not sure whether any rises are going to take place from current levels or we need to drop a little bit further to uh, basically digest all that buying in the stock market that we've seen uh, over the last 12, 18 months, basically. Um, so that's the basic message here for the stock bond ratio. And let's finish this segment with a look at the chart of SPY. Here you see um, SPY versus VBI and X. You see the loss of relative strength. You can see that uh, deceleration of that rising trend. But if we zoom in on the chart of SPY itself, start with the, uh, with the, month, with the weekly chart. We've, we, this is basically an updated chart that we're looking at in Sector Spotlight here pretty much every week. Um, we're challenging that lower boundary of that, of that trend channel here. That negative divergence is, is, is still there, but I hope you agree with me that it is much more pronounced in the stock bond ratio than it is for SPY itself. Um, the negative divergence between MACD and price is definitely there. And that now starts, you can see, 
that the MACD histogram is starting to, um, to, to widen, so the spread is gaining, means that um, the, the, the negative signal from the MACD is expanding. And if we uh, wrap it up with, this, with this, the daily chart of SPY, then you can see that we had this, uh, this gap that was formed uh, last week, Monday, and then we rallied during the week. And this is today, and we have now closed the gap. Gaps must be closed, so we break down. We've closed the gap. There was a nice pullback. I think that we are now at risk of this market having rallied against resistance. So 445 is probably the level to watch. Uh, and if we, the rest of the week, start moving lower, then on the downside, you want to look at this 428.86, let's say 429 level. If that breaks, combined with that negative divergence that you see in the RSI here, um, there, the, that market, that SPY market, the stock market is still definitely at risk for a further decline, despite the longer term uptrend. Don't forget that. So we are looking for, in my longer term view, we are looking for new buying opportunities in, in SPY. Um, just not sure whether this is the right moment. I think we will get a better entry point in the next few weeks. When we move from asset classes to sectors in the stock market, we can see on the right-hand side, we have the daily RRG, left-hand side, we have the weekly for the 11 S&P sectors. If you look at the rotation of the last five trading days, if we make that six, we include today, and then we have Monday to Monday. Um, super strong week performance for the energy sector, uh, followed by financials and then consumer discretionary, uh, to a lesser extent, industrials and materials. Market itself, SPY, up 0.3% over the last six trading days. Technology, flat, um, and then communication services, staples, and then the very weak for real estate and utilities, uh, and also uh, healthcare, actually. So if you look at the, these rotations, then obviously that energy tail uh, catches the eye, but also financials. Financials very nicely, very gradually, nicely moving into the leading quadrant today. So this is last Friday, this is today, so it's moving into the leading quadrant today on the, on the daily RRG. That is a good thing. Discretionary remaining inside leading, but rolling over. Uh, and the other sectors, it remains a bit of a mess, to be honest. Um, communication services, real estate, here is technology, very close to the benchmark, short tail. Utilities shooting off into the lagging quadrant. We've been talking about offense, defense. Well, utilities, defensive sector. I was expecting it to do a lot better together with staples. That didn't happen, it's rolling over. Not sure what to make of it. Uh, and, and quite similar things going on on the weekly. We see that big tail of energy, that big long tail moving up. But look at how low that is on the RS ratio scale. So before energy can be pulled all the way into improving and into leading, we need so much strength on the daily RRG that it's almost impossible to do it in one move. So I'm still going to be very, very cautious with the energy sector. Yes, there is short-term improvement. Yes, this is strong. Question is, <clears throat> how long can it be maintained and how strong is it? Will it be strong enough to pull that energy sector all the way there? Near term, yes, but longer term, I have my doubts. Healthcare and technology inside leading, but rolling over. Uh, we got real estate in weakening, heading towards lagging. 
Again, this is still the second strongest sector, so give it a little bit of leeway. Uh, communication services very close to the benchmark. But here also, look at that financial still. Nicely moving into that positive direction. And if we put those two together, and I think that when you look at the rotation, then the financial sector at the moment is the daily is confirming the weekly and vice versa. That's a good thing. And if we go back to the uh, analysis of, of asset classes, then we saw that government bonds are actually doing very well. And that is probably the only strong relationship that I can do right now is that when, when rates are going up, that's usually a good thing for financials. And it looks as if we are seeing that sort of rotation taking place right now. The rest of the rotations are still um, unclear, confusing, frustrating, all the headlines that we've used over the last few weeks. Financials now seem to be picking up and um, are confirming the uh, apparent strength that's uh, or, or apparent weakness that's occurring in the bond market, which means rising uh, yields, which is rising rates, which is good for, uh, for financials. Let's bring in seasonality and let's start with a look at the seasonal pattern for the S&P itself. As you can see, September was one of the weakest months for the S&P throughout the year, uh, except for January over the last 20 years. But we're going into a good period for the S&P 500. October shows 63% of the months S&P closing higher and November even shows 79% of the months closing higher. So that would suggest that we are entering a good phase for the stock market. Having said that, let's take a look at the breakdown because this is for the S&P itself. Let's take a look at the breakdown of the seasonality for the various sectors. Now this, this picture you may be familiar with. <clears throat> if we look at the months of outperformance, then we're looking for very, either very high or very low numbers. And there are not really very high and very low numbers. There's actually only one that's really high that is very convincing, and that is 79% for XLK, for the technology sector. That means that 79%, almost 80% of the months over the last 20 years, XLK outperformed the S&P 500. That's something to take into account. To a lesser extent, we have 58%, 60% for communication services outperforming the S&P 500 in the month of October. I have, this one is actually, this is interesting. Industrials is weak going into October, but then is going to a very strong period to the end of the year, 90%, 89%. So um, maybe not right now, but keep an eye on the industrial sector from a seasonal perspective in the next few weeks, because this is not, this is not, this seasonality doesn't start on the first of the month and ends on the 30 or 31st. I mean, this is a gradual process. So uh, I just wanted to, to pinpoint the, uh, the very high number, the very high reading for industrials that's coming up in November. Now on the weaker side, we have 32%, which is 68% um, of the times healthcare is underperforming the S&P 500. And for the same goes for energy, there are 63% of the time underperforming. What are the numbers that we are looking at? Because this is just the months where the, where the sectors are outperforming or underperforming the S&P 500. If you bring that into numbers, then um, <clears throat> it's actually technology is, is confirming that strength. The average performance for the month of October for technology is 2.2%. Uh, for communication services, it's 1.3% which is also very good. And then we have on the, uh, on the downside, we have energy underperforming the S&P 500 by 90 basis points over the last 20 years. And for healthcare, we see an average underperformance of 90 basis points as well. I've also highlighted utilities because they apparently are going into a weak period with minus 60 and minus 1.6%. Um, in the, in the month of October and following November. <clears throat> Another way to visualize this is um, the image that you may have seen a few times already, uh, and I like it. I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to move away from the spreadsheet and, and start doing it with 
this vis, so for the time being I'm using them uh, alongside just basically to get used to it. And if we switch this to October and this one to December, then we will have a similar picture and we can add the numbers. So here is the 79%. So we're looking for fat greens and thin reds. So here's your fat green where technology 79% outperforming with 2.2%. Um, and we have 58%, uh, the 60 is communication services outperforming. 1.3%. Uh, the data is a little bit more updated than in the uh, in the spreadsheet. So communication services and technology um, seem to be in the right spot for um, the month of October from a seasonal perspective. If you look at energy, that is actually 37% uh, outperformance, so 63 underperformance, 90 bips down, and we have 32 for um, healthcare. So these are but the rest is all around 50%. So when it's around 50%, doesn't really make a big difference. Maybe financials is interesting to look at. Um, although, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not super strong. It's not super strong. It's just a 50-50 um, toss of a coin. Uh, but the, the tail looks very nice. So that is, you know, maybe above, I don't know. I, the tail looks very good. Other than that, 40, 47, 47, that doesn't, doesn't make it very, very interesting from a uh, relative uh, or seasonal relative perspective. If we go back to the, to the slideshow, then I have actually <coughs> um, summarized it in a table to to blend the current rotations and what we see from a seasonal point of view. And unfortunately, there is no strong confirmation for the observations that we're having either on the RRG or from a seasonal perspective. So if we look at the communication services sector, the seasonal pattern is definitely strong. 58% of the time that sector is outperforming uh, the S&P in October and the average Outperformance is 1.3%. Looking at the RRG doesn't make me super happy. There's not a super strong trend, a super strong tail for communication services visible at the moment. So keep an eye on communication services. When the tail of XLC starts to improve and move into a strong heading, that might be a good moment to pick up uh, some communication services stocks trying to beat the S&P 500. If we look at the energy sector, then obviously that's a, that's a negative, 37% uh, only outperformance, 63% underperformance, and a 90%, a whopping 90% underperformance versus the S&P 500 on average. If you look at the RRG, then maybe you remember that we had the weekly tail inside lagging but pointing up, and we had the daily tail strongly into the leading quadrant. So they're kind of opposite, they're kind of... Um, Conflicting. Now, I think that when you will see the daily tail, which is now very high, rolling over, that might be a good idea to get rid of some energy stocks or short them or benefit in any way from an underperformance of energy stocks. Technology is very strong from a seasonal point of view. Expected performance 2.2% but the tail on the RRG is not super strong. It's inside leading, but it's losing relative strength or uh, relative momentum. Nevertheless, that's probably your best bet to outperform the S&P 500, having some allocation to technology. Never, don't forget that it's not a guarantee that the absolute performance of the technology sector will be positive as well. We're expecting it to outperform the S&P 500. And from uh, the last one, the healthcare, that's a negative seasonal, expecting 90 bips underperformance. And here also the RRG is some sort of conflicting. It's, it's more positive than negative. So there's not really a nice um, confirmation there on the RRG or the seasonal pattern. So the best bet for the moment, probably the technology sector going into October. And this wraps up Sector Spotlight for this week. Remember, Sector Spotlight airs every Tuesday from 10.30 to 11 a.m. Eastern. 
I hope to see you again next week at a new episode of Sector Spotlight. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.